Maybe next week, the Department of Education can make laws about littering. Dylan Schumacher sit it out the fence. Now, before we go over to the whiteboard here and kind of catch you up on the moratorium on rent collection that the CDC has put out and really dive in depth to the depths of depravity and insanity, I wanted to take a moment to just point out the really blatantly obvious. The federal government has made it illegal to collect money from people who live on your property. I'd like to say that again because I, I think it's pretty self-evident how insane it is. The federal government has made it illegal for you to collect money from people who voluntarily choose to live on your property. Uh, that is absolutely insane. The federal government has outlawed your business. If you are a person and you're a landlord and that's what you do and that, that's how you make your livelihood, they have effectively made your job illegal. Now, we're going to talk about the process by which they did that and how that's insane. But even if, hypothetically speaking, Congress voted on and passed a law and the president signed it into law and, and the Supreme Court came in and said, yep, you can make that illegal, that would still be insane. That would still be illegal and wrong. Uh, one of the things in this country we have is the life, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of happiness has to do with business venture and developing your property. Uh, we have rights to property. Property rights are foundational to the American system of government and to the American way of life. And the federal government has communistically trampled right over your very real property rights because they feel like it. So you can give me all the, the, all, but it's a pandemic and people are sick and they lost their job. They lost their job because the government made it illegal for them to go to work. So the government has come in, caused a mess, destroyed the entire economy, and then come in for round two of destruction and said, oh yeah, because of the pandemic, you can't collect rent. Uh, I know that we told them they couldn't go to work. I know that we wouldn't allow them to make money. I know that we're using our, your tax dollars to pay the money to stay home and not go to work, but they still can't pay you money. That's what the federal government has done. It is absolutely insane that the federal government has made it illegal for you to collect money for people who voluntarily choose to live on your property. Uh, they have made thieves out of millions of people by allowing them to live rent-free on people's property. It violates the most basic rights we have in this country. Uh, you know, you have the right to speech and the right to self-defense. Those are probably the top two rights, right? The right to worship whatever God you want. The First and Second Amendment, basically. And then right behind that, we have property rights, which are absolutely foundational to the Constitution, to our understanding of how this republic is supposed to work. And without them, we're back to warlords and might makes right. So, let's go over to the whiteboard now and really dive into just how absolutely depraved and ridiculous this is. So let's talk about the rent moratorium. Rent moratorium here has just been uh, extended by the CDC. To catch you up, uh, the rent moratorium was initially issued, I believe back in September of 2020 by the CDC who was then under President Trump. It was illegal then, it's illegal now, we'll get to that. Uh, then in July, the Supreme Court uh, heard the, the case, which they should have, and they decided in a 5-4 vote to uphold the rent moratorium. Brent Kavanaugh, the deciding vote in that case, decided, you know what, uh, this is unconstitutional. However, it's going to expire soon, so we'll just let it go. And now, of course, we find ourselves in a situation where that has been extended until mid-October. And if you think it's going to end there, well, I'm not quite sure what to tell you. So the rent moratorium, which carries a penalty of a year in jail and a hundred thousand dollar fine for evicting someone from your property who doesn't pay their rent because they were impacted by coronavirus or whatever, uh, is a big, big problem. We'll talk a little bit about that. But first of all, let's talk about how we get this edict and where it comes from, shall we? So down here, you have the rent moratorium edict, right? This is the, the problem that we currently find ourselves in. Now, this was sent out by the CDC. The CDC was established in 1946 
uh, in order to combat malaria and, and other infectious diseases and, and take care of things like that. So they're headquartered out of Atlanta and have been since the beginning. Now, the CDC falls under the United States Public Health Service. The United States Public Health Service is a group of uh, agencies like the CDC that fall under the Human Health and Services Department, the Department of Human Health and Services. The Human Health and Services Department, are you confused yet, uh, reports to the president. Now, some of you are smarter than the rest of us and you immediately see what the problem is and why this is very, very bad. So, for those of you who aren't as smart as some of us, uh, you might need a little reminder about how the United States Republic works, right? We are a republic, not a democracy, and we have three branches of government. They are not co-equal in power. Uh, however, they are three distinct branches of government. So you have the judiciary branch, the executive branch under the president, and the legislative branch, right? You have Congress, the Supreme Court, and then the president, which this really should say executive up here, but you get the idea. Those are your three branches of government. The most powerful of the three branches of government as designed and enshrined in the Constitution is the legislative branch. They have the power to levy taxes, they have the power to declare war, and they have the power to write laws. They have multiple powers that the other branches do not possess, and with good reason. Congress is elected directly from the people. Uh, the, the people directly choose their representatives to go to Congress and represent them. So therefore, it is the largest body in, in our government, and it also, again, has the most power as constitutionally written. The legislative branch makes laws. No other branch of government makes laws. Not the president, not the judiciary, no other branch of government is supposed to make laws. What has happened over time is that other branches of government have stolen this power from Congress, which makes the entire system untenable in the long term. The issue here is that not only is the president, who is one person, making a law, however, you have multiple levels of bureaucracy by people that are paid with your tax dollars, that are not elected, not appointed, and simply hired by the president or one of his underlings in order to have their job. So you have zero representation or voting or legal recourse for someone down the bureaucracy chain making a law. So what's happened is we get down here to the CDC, who's several levels deep, several levels removed, is a pure bureaucracy, and they are now issuing laws. Not just laws about diseases or sicknesses or whatever, they are issuing laws about rent. If the CDC can make laws that are not voted on by Congress, not debated in both houses, not signed into law by the president, then laws have no meaning anymore. Literally anyone could make a law. I can sit in my house and write something on a piece of paper and declare it to be a law if the CDC can make laws. You might say, oh my God, Dylan, that's ridiculous. And that's precisely my point. The executive branch does not make laws. The judiciary branch is not supposed to make laws, but that's a different video. Instead, the legislative branch is supposed to make laws. And it's intentionally difficult for the legislative branch to make laws. So that the idea, of course, is that the laws are well thought through, that they're not made in a fit of passion, but rather they have large support and they are reasoned and thought through. They're not simply something that is just pulled out of thin air because it seems like a good idea at the time. That's how the system is designed to work. And at this point, we have wholly and utterly ignored the system entirely and said some random bureaucracy way down the chain can all of a sudden make federal law that applies to everybody in the United States. If you're not quite grasping how incredibly dangerous that is, again, I don't know how to explain that any clearer. If any government bureaucracy can write something on a piece of paper and now it's just a law, then there are no such thing as laws anymore. We have wholly abandoned the system of how we are to govern ourselves. And at this point, might makes right. Why can the CDC write it on a piece of paper and make a law and I can't? Because they have more men with guns than I do in order to back it up. 
That really is what it boils down to. To really understand how convoluted this is and how this gets worse, you need to understand where this executive branch and all this bureaucracy came from. In 1939, Congress passed the Reorganization Act of 1939. This created the FSA. The FSA stands for, I believe, the Federal Security Administration, if I am correct. And the problem is this created the executive office of the president. It created all of the permanent structures that now reside under the president. Currently, there are 1,800 staff that are not appointed, not elected, uh, simply hired that work as part of the permanent government and are considered nonpartisan. Uh, these are the people that operate the staff of the president's office, right? So presidents come in and come out, but this is the, the, what we call the deep state, right? This is the permanent part of the government that just stays uh, and, and continues to grow and thrive. Again, remember, large government and liberty, individual liberty, are incompatible. You cannot have them both at the same time. The larger one gets, the more the other will diminish. In 1953, you have the reorganization plan number one under Eisenhower. What this does is effectively eliminate the FSA and replace it with the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, at that time, it was named something else. I think it included the term the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. I'm looking at my notes here to confirm that. Uh, and then the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare in 1979 splits out to get the Department of Education. Has there been a more failed or useless government organization than the Department of Education? I'm just saying. And then in 1995, they also split out the Social Security Administration. So again, the problem here is that way back in 1939, you had the legislative branch perhaps unknowingly at the time, probably knowingly, ceding substantial power to the executive branch, creating this entire bureaucratic mess that has resulted in some random health organization deciding whether or not you can collect rent from your renters. Now, if you're to say, Dylan, who cares? They're just renters. It's not that many people. Uh, you know, surely they can afford it. They obviously own property, whatever. What you need to remember is that property costs money to maintain. And you have turned an entire class of people who provide a very important service of renting property so that people have places to live into a slave class. Now, there are two ways that's gonna go when those people can't own that property anymore. They'll default on their loans, go into bankruptcy, and now we have a bunch of people going into bankruptcy. They'll sell it uh, to some larger corporation who will then, of course, become a large, uh, we'll just call them feudal lord in America, which causes its whole host of other problems. Or my favorite option, plan C, C for communism, is the government will take it over and they'll, of course, now be able to provide your rent. Then when people are further and more dependent on the government, you, of course, have less rights because you can't challenge the government because they provide everything you need. And then just to top it all off, as I mentioned earlier, you have the Supreme Court screaming into the rescue to say that, hey, it's okay that this government organization, who is not the legislative branch, makes laws. That's totally okay for them to make up a federal law, even though they have zero authority under the executive branch to do so, zero authority as a health organization to do so. It's okay if they do that because it's only temporary. It's just two weeks to slow the spread, right? I hope that this has been helpful to you. I hope that it's helped you understand that the authority, and I put that in quotes here, that the CDC is claiming that they stand on is absolutely zero. They have zero authority to make laws whatsoever. Even the Supreme Court agreed that it's unconstitutional, but you know, it's gonna expire, so it's okay. If we are going to allow random government organizations to just create laws out of thin air when they have no authority to do so, then this nation is at its end. The next phase is that when we all realize the authority is illegitimate, and I'm not quite sure what happens then, but I don't think it's gonna be very good. Do brave deeds and endure.